Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me back to UCLA. Four to five years ago, Professor Lowenstein and I sat in this same room, and we discussed the question, God and the Tooth Fairy. But tonight, we've been assigned the hardest question that anybody faces. Yesterday, 70 years ago, Auschwitz was liberated. And I watched as some of the survivors of Auschwitz met in that freezing cold place in Poland and described the horrors that they had experienced. By far the most moving was a very articulate man of 93, Roman Kent. And with tears in his eyes, he said to the audience, we must ensure that our past is not our children's future. I've been to Auschwitz many times. I've wept every time. Just that the sheer horror of the atrocities that were committed there. And that's enough to show us that we're dealing with a very difficult question. Now, what I intend to do for a few minutes is to map out the question. And then <clears throat> we're going to enter into a conversation about it for the most part of this evening. So let's just think about the question. The problem of evil, as we call it divides into two, really. There's the problem of moral evil, like Auschwitz, the bad things that people do to one another. And then there's the problem of natural evil, tsunamis, earthquakes. I arrived in New Zealand two days after the devastating earthquake in Christchurch and spent a whole week facing the press and the cameras trying to help people come to terms with earthquake why and meeting people that had lost their loved ones. So there's a problem of moral evil and there's a problem of natural evil. Earthquakes on the large scale, brain tumors, cancers on the smaller scale. So there are two sources of the problem. There are also two perspectives on it. <clears throat> Cancer looks very different to a professor of oncology and to a young woman who's just been told that she has six months to live. In other words, there's an intellectual perspective. We observe suffering. But there's a pastoral perspective. We suffer. And that's a very different thing. And sometimes we have to fulfill both roles at once. We have to observe our own suffering and try to come to terms with it. And there are two scales of suffering. There's the large scale, the earthquakes, tsunamis, in which thousands of people are wiped out in an instant. But then for the individual, getting a brain tumor appears to be equally significant because it's totally devastating for you. So there are two problems, there are two perspectives, and there are two scales on which we look at it. <clears throat> We've got two halves to our brain. And I've been very interested in reading the work of Ian McGilchrist who's a, a leading psychiatrist in Britain. And he points out that in our intellectual societies, we've become very left-brained. We're 
taking things apart to see how they work. And he reminds us that there's a right-hand side to the brain that puts things together to see what they mean. And there's a sense in which we have to apply both sides of our brain to this particular question. We've got to take things apart. But we've also, and this is the biggest problem of all, try to integrate things to see if we can make any sense of them. And you know, when I think of these questions, I think of two cathedrals, Coventry Cathedral in England, or Dresden Cathedral, if you like. And you go into them, and you see a bomb has hit them. But you see something else. You see traces of beauty. Christchurch Cathedral, you see an earthquake has hit it, and you can see traces of beauty. The picture that's presented is mixed. I call it barbed wire and beauty. And as we try to investigate this problem, it's really getting to terms with both the beauty and the barbed wire. What story, if any, makes sense of it? Now, our reactions to these things depend on our worldview. That is, our general set of answers to the big questions of life. And everybody in this room has a worldview ranging from the secularist, to the theistic, to the pantheistic, to the skeptical. We all have a worldview. And as we come to the deepest question of life, we react according to our worldview. And the reactions are very different. When the earthquake hit, for instance, in New Zealand, some reacted in this way with a famous Hebrew poem, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. And somehow they held on to their faith in God, using poetry like this. But there are others who are more pantheistic in their thinking and who take the view that those who suffer do so because of their sin in a previous life. And the suffering helps them to work off their karma. Therefore, there's no point in relieving their pain since that will only serve to prolong the process of purification. And then the, the, there were yet other really hardliners who said this earthquake or the tsunami in Japan is, is the judgment of God. And then others go to the other side and say, look, isn't this the final evidence that there is no God at all? And whenever this topic comes up, we're reminded, as David Hume pointed out long ago, I quote, Epicurus's old questions are yet unanswered. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then is he malevolent? Is he both able and willing? Whence then this evil? Now that's something we're going to return to. But <clears throat> to conclude my initial remarks, I just want to say that I have enormous sympathy with people whose observation of suffering or whose personal experience of it has turned them into atheists. I have many friends in Oxford. They're brilliant people. They're interested in the God question. Some of them are even prepared to say, look, there is evidence of God and the rational intelligibility of the universe, but please don't make it personal. There cannot be any personal God who cares for us. Just look at the mess the world is in. I say I have deep sympathy with people like that. I'll never forget many years ago sitting with two friends from Israel. I just met them, and we were having a discussion. And they discovered, to their amazement, that I believed in God. And uh, it was husband and wife. They were very brilliant engineers. And they said, look, 
it's a bit difficult because we don't believe in God. And I said that's odd because part of the reason I believe in God is because of your history. Why don't you believe in God? And they said, we'd rather not tell you. And I said, that's okay. They said, we're, you know, we respect people who believe in God, but we just can't, and that's it. But after a few minutes' conversation, they changed their minds. And the husband said to me, look, we are going to tell you, but please don't hold us responsible for the consequences. And I said, look, I don't know what's coming, but if my faith in God can't face deep questions, it's not worth believing in. So he said, well, we love literature. And we, were, we read to one another as husband and wife. And we were reading a book by Bashevitz Singer, the Nobel Prize winner for literature. It's called The Slave. And in that book, there's a horrific account of how in Russia, in one of the pogroms, women and children were buried alive. And I don't know whether it's Singer, I read the book subsequently, but it's dim in my memory, or whether it was these two. They just sat and they said to me, the light went out. The light went out. And we just haven't been able to believe in God since. That resonates with me. I mean, you'd be made of stone if you didn't resonate with that. But it raises questions. And I just want to look at one of the questions it raises. And that is, suppose <clears throat> we go down the route that removes God and says, okay, that's it then. There is no God. That's the end of the story. That raises problems as to where our ideas of evil come from. The Russian novelist Dostoevsky, I've spent a lot of time in Russia and talked to people about these things. But he once wrote in the book, The Brothers Karamazov, Yesli Bogan yet to his volume, if God does not exist, everything is permissible. What he was saying is not that atheists can't behave morally, of course they can. What he was saying was something much deeper. If there's no God, there is actually no rational basis for morality. Now, it's interesting that in connection with our topic on Monday night, Richard Dawkins says something very, very similar. Listen to his analysis of the bleakness of existence. It goes like this. <clears throat> in a universe of blind physical forces, and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt. Other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Please notice, no good, no evil. And so I asked the question, were the people you saw up on the screen, were the perpetrators of the Holocaust, were the architects of the killing fields in Cambodia and Rwanda, were Stalin, Hitler, and Mao simply dancing to the music of their DNA? Well, if that's the case, there is no morality. They're not responsible. There's no good. There's no evil. So we might as well just resign ourselves to it without complaint. Now, here's where I find the very odd thing. Richard Dawkins' analysis gets rid of good and evil, and yet, He's one of the loudest in talking about the problem of evil. I find that a disconnect. Something very strange is going on at a very deep level. How can you, on the one hand, reject the concept of good and evil and say it doesn't exist, and at the same time be very, very vocal in your condemnation of what you perceive to be the problem of evil? Charles Taylor the brilliant author of this secular age says this, 
the modern age, more or less repudiating the idea of a divine lawgiver, <clears throat> has nevertheless tried to retain the ideas of moral right and wrong. Not noticing that, in casting God aside, they've also abolished the conditions of meaningfulness for moral right and wrong as well. Educated people do not need to be told, however, that questions such as this have never been answered outside of religion. And it was Friedrich Nietzsche who, perhaps better than anybody else, saw that the consequences of abandoning the transcendent morality that's based on the biblical revelation and which has influenced the West for centuries would lead to a complete devaluation of all moral concepts. He predicted that the death of God would lead to a Darwinian imperative of expressing the will to power. The biblical prohibition, thou shalt not kill, he wrote, is a piece of naivety. Life itself recognizes no solidarity, no equal rights, <clears throat> between the healthy and the degenerate parts of an organism, one must excise the latter or the whole will perish. And in a very significant statement, he said this, when one gives up Christian belief, therefore one deprives oneself of the right to Christian morality. Christian morality is a command. Its origin is transcendental. It possesses truth only if God is truth. It stands or falls with belief in God. Nietzsche then asked the question, why morality at all, when life, nature, history are all non-moral? Now, having got rid of God, there has been, for quite a few years now, a tremendous attempt to get some sort of concept of good and evil from within the universe, at the level of genetics, of the level of social evolution, and so on and so forth. But some of the attempts are fascinating. Perhaps the most interesting is that of the famous Michael Ruse and E. O. Wilson, where <clears throat> they suggest that <clears throat> ethics is an illusion foisted upon us by our genes to get us to cooperate. So basic ethics, according to them, is unethical, which seems to be to imply a serious contradiction at the very base of things. So what I'm suggesting to you to begin with is this. I'm very sympathetic and understand the people that take the atheist route, but I see first a major problem in that the very concepts of good and evil dissolve. But secondly, and we'll have to come back to this because I'm going to say this without justification, except it's logically clear that it's true. Atheism does not remove the suffering. It's still there. But what it does remove is all hope by definition. There is no ultimate hope in an atheistic universe. So the situation is very bleak. And when I put this to Richard Dawkins, he said, well, because it's bleak, it doesn't mean it's false. And I said, no, but because it's bleak, it doesn't mean it's true either. So that's the way I would want to begin. But I'm dying to hear from my colleague, Daniel, and I've said quite enough. So over to you, sir. Thank you, John, uh, and uh, <coughs> thank you for being here, coming all the way from uh, England, Oxford, England, and thanks to the uh, Veritas Forum for hosting this evening uh, and inviting me to participate, and as well as John. And thank all of you for being here, and uh, also those of you who are giving us your attention uh, over the internet. Let me just say one thing about my role here tonight. I'm here uh, as an interviewer of uh, John for the next uh, part of the program. Uh, I'm not here arguing with him. I'm not here agreeing with him. As I see it, my role is simply uh, by asking questions and follow-ups to uh, help him make his case uh, as well as he can. As I mentioned uh, uh, earlier when we were talking to each other, if 
Daw Richard Dawkins were here or Daniel Dennett or one of the other new atheists and somebody asked me to do the same thing, I, I would have exactly the same goal uh, in, in uh, interacting with them. Uh, so I'm not on any side here, uh, but uh, I, as John mentioned, uh, I did something like this with him here, I think it was three years ago. Uh, we both enjoyed it very much, we've become friends, uh, and uh, uh, I, I'm just very happy to be here uh, again with him and with all of you. Um, my wife and I are going up to, this, to San Francisco this weekend to see the Leonard Bernstein uh, musical Candide, and I think I was thinking about that, and it gave me the idea for one question that I'd like to start out by asking John. I think this <coughs> comes out of some of the comments uh, that he made just now uh, as well. Um, in the 18th century, uh, particularly the German philosopher Leibniz, and then many people following him, such as the great poet uh, Alexander Pope, got the idea that, uh, and this is the phrase that's used, uh, this is the best of all possible worlds. And uh, uh, Voltaire made fun of this idea in his little novella. Some of you have probably read it. It's very funny and very enjoyable to read, uh, called Candide, uh, in which uh, some naive young people went out into the world and found that uh, uh, the greatest of all, po or the best of all possible worlds uh, had a lot of evils in it, including a famous earthquake at that time, not in yeah. New Zealand, but in uh, Madrid. So, um, but the idea that uh, Leibniz and his people who agreed with him had is by no means a frivolous idea. Their idea was, and John in a way alluded to this, their idea was if God is perfectly good and if God is omniscient, in other words, he knows everything that's going on, and if God is omnipotent, meaning he can achieve whatever he wants, then it would follow that a God that had those three characteristics would create and maintain the best of all possible worlds because he has the knowledge to do it, he has the power to do it, and he has the goodness uh, to do it. So I would like to ask you, John, uh, to start, um, do you believe this is the best of all possible worlds? And if not, why not if God has those attributes? But if it is, how can we reconcile that with Auschwitz, with Ebola, uh, with these terrible earthquakes, uh, and with the young person who is afflicted with cancer? This is, of course, the, the really central hard question. And <clears throat> the difficulty is when you approach it, the idea that this is the best of all possible worlds grates on us because we immediately think of some awful thing like Ebola and cancer and so on. So instead of approaching it round that way, I like to try to see what it is about our world that makes certain things that we find unacceptable possible. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> you see, very frequently, and I'm sure as students you set up late at night, surely a good God would, could, might, etc., have been able to make a world in which these things didn't happen. Could God, for instance, have made a world in which there was no damage like we see people doing to one another? The answer is, of course he could. Now let me take that head on. Of course he could. We can make worlds like that. They're called robotic worlds. Now the interesting thing about the robotic world is this, that <clears throat> it is certain very positive properties. It obeys us perfectly, of course, because it's all programmed in. But it is a world that's devoid of love. Now, here comes the real problem for me. If we think of love as a value, as something very important, then, of course, logically speaking, the capacity to love is equivalent to the capacity to choose. There must be a modicum of freedom. 
So if I'm going to be able to choose positively, I must be able to choose negatively. So the, there must be the possibility of things going wrong. C.S. Lewis long ago, and he's had a great influence on me intellectually, he made the point <clears throat> that, for instance, if God was to alter the air so that when I'm singing happily and saying nice things to you, it carries the sound. But if I start to tell lies to you, the air closes down and you don't hear me. That would, again, to turn me into a robot. Now, let me follow that. <clears throat> I've got a wife. I've been married for 46 years. I'm glad she's not a robot. I mean, if I were to go home and meet her and there's the big iPad, kiss, and you press the button mark, kiss, <clears throat> You get a robotic response, but you're laughing because you see it would be inhuman. Now, let's go back to the best of all possible worlds. What I find that I do sometimes in wishing the world to be other than it is, is that I'm wishing myself out of existence. Have you ever thought about that? That if the world were different, and a robotic world where not, no harm happened, no good, an amoral world, you wouldn't exist in it. So that's the problem. And I say this quite reverently. God took a risk in making a world like this. I have children, I have three of them, and seven grandchildren. I took a risk having them. And if you have children, you'll take a risk having them. What do I mean by that? Well, I remember holding the first child and realizing this little girl could grow up to say no to me. Why then have children? Well, aren't you glad your parents had children? <laughs> None of you would exist. You see, as we look at our human situation, this whole question takes on a different light. Now, I'm not saying this solves the problem. What I'm trying to do is answer Professor Lowenstein's problem in, to get a plausibility, at least reason, to see that there's something in the nature of what it means to be truly human and of freedom that necessitates you have a world in which damage can be done. Now, of course, there's another question to come along the road. What happens if the damage is done? Is it permanent or what, what is going to happen? But the fact that we live in a world where love is possible means we live in a world where hate is possible. That's not permission to have hate, but it is the fact that it is possible. So that's how I would start that. My wife's in the audience. I think she might uh, prefer <clears throat> sometimes the robot, especially when there are chores to be done around the house. But. Uh, um, I, th I think we might want to come back to some of those things, but I want to uh, respond to that by referring <coughs> to something you said right at the beginning of your opening remarks uh, when you made the point, which I think is a very important one, that we can divide evil into two categories. Yes. Moral evil, which we might refer to as man-made or human-made yes. evil, and then there's natural evil. Um, the, earth, the damaging earthquakes, the terrible diseases, and so mm -hmm. on. And I wonder if you'd comment on that, because uh, even if one completely accepts the answer you just gave, that if people are to be free and therefore capable of loving and being loved, uh, they, they have to have choices to make any, you know, to, to make any, have any stakes at all. The choices have to be, uh, have consequences, good or bad. And that includes bad consequences. So even if we went all the way down that road, that would not obviously answer the question of why we have these non-human made evils that are also so terrible for, for innocent human beings, children. You're, you're perfectly right. You're perfectly right. They are separate questions. They can be related, of course, <clears throat> because sometimes moral evil leads to natural evil. People exploit the environment, there's no food, and the next generation starves. So you, you get that connection. But I take your point completely. And it leads to the same kind of consideration. It's very strange because just before I went to New Zealand, I was reading a book on plate 
tectonics, which is not my normal reading. <laughs> and I was intrigued to discover what I didn't know before was that the, the moving of the tectonic plates on the surface of the Earth, which leads to earthquakes, of course, is utterly essential for life. Now, here you have a really strange paradox. The very thing that caused the destruction in Christchurch is utterly necessary to keep humans alive. And, of course, that raises the same kind of question that I raised in the previous slot. Could God not have made a world in which there were tectonic plates that did no damage? Could he have made a universe in which there was fire, but it couldn't burn? A universe that wasn't dangerous? Now, these are impossible questions to answer, but they're very, very interesting to ask. You know, we are utterly dependent for our life on the most dangerous object in the solar system, the sun. And we're utterly dependent for our life on it. Now, they're rhetorical questions. We cannot answer them. But somehow it seems to me that in the very nature of things, reality is very much more complicated than we think. Now, of course, as the archdeacon of Christ Church said, the earthquakes weren't sinning. They were simply doing what earthquakes do. The tectonic plates were moving. The, the, the mistake, of course, is to build houses above fault lines. And, of course, if you know where the fault lines are, that's okay, but often you just don't know where they are. And what's true of earthquakes <clears throat> on the large, as in Christchurch, is true of what I call earthquakes in the brain, brain tumors and things like that. How do we come to terms? with those. And if I might make it slightly personal just for a moment, um, I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. Uh, some of you might be happy to know that, but um, about eight years ago, I was rushed through a hospital and essentially told that I was about to die. I said goodbye to my wife. So I've had that experience, which is very interesting, by the way. And um, I could come to that again if it's raised, but the point I'm making is that medical intervention saved my life. And people say, you thank God for that. And I say, yes, I do. But I say, just a moment. In those weeks when my life was saved, my niece of 22 just married had an earthquake in her brain, and it killed her. What am I going to say to my sister? And if I can't say anything to my sister, I'd better be careful when I start saying, thank God that I have been uh, rescued from this. So this, this is a very sensitive thing because people are hurting. So <clears throat> it seems to me that, do you want to come in with another question? No, you, why don't you finish Let it? me tell you what I would be thinking of saying next, and you can say whether I can say it or not. <laughs> Uh, Daniel's a lawyer, and I'm very respectful of lawyers, you know, because they're, they're, they're very good at asking uh, leading questions. But I'm teaching a seminar this term, as I mentioned to you, on John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, so I'm not in the mood to cut in and prevent people from saying what they want to say. Well, <laughs> it would be a very nice unmillion thing to do. It's right? nice of you to give me the liberty, but the logical situation here is this, for both of these problems. We can argue from now to midnight and beyond what a good God should, would, might, could. And have any of you ever found that argument satisfactory? I haven't. I've done it thousands of times. But somehow you end up with, this isn't good enough. And I think I know why it's not good enough. It's because after we've done all the arguing, we're left with beauty and barbed wire. It's there. That's the way life is. Whatever the philosophical explanation, whatever way we go up and down and reason about it, 
both at the level of moral evil and natural evil, there's an immense amount of beauty and there's an immense amount of horror. Now, I thought about that for a very long time. And I asked myself, how can you come to terms with that? So, I asked myself a different question. And here's a different question. It's this, granted that it's like that for all of us, is there any evidence anywhere in the universe that there's a God that you could trust with it? Do you get the question? Is there any evidence anywhere in the universe that there's a God you could trust with it? Now, what I can come on to, and I just sketch it briefly, and Daniel can unpick it if he wants to, is this. The heart of Christianity is a cross. Now, the central claim of Christianity is that Jesus is God. So, the crude question that arises is this, what's God doing on a cross? And at the very least, what that says to me is this, that God has not remained distant from human suffering, but has himself become part of it. And that is where not a solution begins. I never talk about solutions to these problems. But that is where, for me, hope begins. That, that actually was a question that I did want to raise at some point this evening if I had a chance. So, uh, and you've partly answered it, but maybe I can ask you to expand on it. I, I, I think that um, obviously there are many religious religions in the world, many religious views and, and <coughs> systems that people uh, adhere to and believe in. Uh, and uh, it does seem to me that not only the unique thing about Christianity, but the truly astonishing and bewildering uh, thing about Christianity compared to any other worldview is the idea that God would uh, assume human form mm -hmm. and undergo human suffering. Uh, and furthermore, I guess, undergo human suffering to a degree that uh, none of us could begin to comprehend because he's not just sort of suffering for his sins or any, any one person's sins, but for all the sins. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, I mean, somehow that does seem relevant to this problem, but can you think, and it's very, I think it's very difficult to think about this and probably to talk about it, but how should that affect the way we think of uh, evil and suffering in the world? The way it affects my thinking is this. If that's all there was, there'd be no window into a solution. But if the central claims of Christianity are true, Christ rose again from the dead. Now that puts a completely different light on the whole question. You see, when we go through all of this discussion, normally in a secular context, the hidden assumption is death's the end. And that's why I said atheism is hopeless by definition, because death is the end. And for the vast majority of people in the world, in history, life has not been particularly happy. So there's no hope. Now, let's follow me because <clears throat> I think it's worthwhile, whether you, you may disagree completely, that's fine. But <clears throat> it's good to listen at least to what Christianity has to say to see if it makes any coherent sense. Because if it makes no coherent sense, you may forget about it, because coherence is at least one of the criteria of truth. The other one is, does it correspond to reality? So the distance we've got at the moment is this, that this is God becoming human, incredible as it may seem, 
and dying and suffering, but then rising again. Now, when the early apostles went round the world and proclaimed that Jesus had risen from the dead, one of the major things they said was this, therefore, there is going to be a final judgment. And that wasn't a grim idea, it was a wonderful idea. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, did you notice, I didn't emphasize it when I read Richard Dawkins, he says there's no justice. But that's a horrific concept. I mean, just think of what that means. If death is the end, the vast majority of people who have ever lived will never get justice. They don't get it in this life, and there's no next life to get it in. And I put this to Dawkins directly in public, and he said, well, I work for justice in this life. And I said, so do I, Richard. That's a wonderful thing to do, but it still is the fact that there is no ultimate justice, so the terrorists get away with it. The people that stoked the folks into the gas chambers get away with it. Hitler gets cornered, he blows his brains out, he's got away with it. Do you really believe in a universe like that? Because if you do, you're essentially saying that your conscience that demands justice is an illusion. I don't believe it's an illusion. But the thing that backs it up is the fact that I believe that because Jesus rose from the dead, he's going to be the judge. And nobody's going to get away with it. That is a magnificent message. And therefore, because he's utterly fair and righteous, he's going to be a, able to assess all this kind of thing. And I would go even further than that. You see, I... I was really moved to tears listening to Roman Kent last night because he talked about the children in Auschwitz who were murdered almost instantly. And he said, as I remember their screams, I wondered, do their screams ever reach heaven? That's a very poignant thing to say, a very moving thing. And I, I sat there just transfixed last night, it was. And I thought, did they? If God is who I think he is, is Jesus Christ, then they did reach heaven. And God has done something so magnificent with those kids that if you could see it, you might have fewer questions. You see, what Christianity gives me is not a simple solution. It doesn't take away the pain, <clears throat> but it can give tremendous hope so that my 22-year-old niece, and I talked to her before she died. She died full of hope. That's what makes the difference. Uh, and therefore, sorry to go on about that, but you've got to take two things together then in the, in the Christian message, both the death and the resurrection of Christ. This idea of there being a final judgment is a wonderful idea. Now, we react against it because we don't like the idea of being judged. But that's where the other side of Christianity came in that Daniel mentioned to you. That when Christ was dying, he wasn't merely suffering. He was dying for our sin so that we could receive forgiveness. So this is an immense package, really, that deals with the problem. And it is, as Daniel said, utterly unique. Um. I hadn't really expected to ask you this at all, but it seems so much to come out of what you just said. Um, I think, and I'm no historian of Christianity by any means, but I, my, my impression is that until somewhere between a, a century and a half century ago, uh, Christian thought, Christian teaching uh, was you know, very much front stage was the idea of hell and the idea of punishment. Mm. Um, I think that has been much less emphasized uh, in the last century or half century. Um, if I take what you just said, how, how important is the idea of punishment? I mean, that is uh, making right 
the, peop the innocent people who have suffered uh, on earth is one aspect of justice, and it it's, is, yeah. it's the one that's consoling and pleasant <clears throat> for us to think of if it really is true. But the other side of justice is uh, punishment. Um, how do you think a modern Christian should think about that question of punishment of those who do evil? Well, of course, in the Middle Ages, people's imagination ran riot with Dante and so on. But the thing that weighs with me most is something that I remember thinking about when I was very young. The, the central statement in the whole of the Bible about the love of God is something that many people have learned. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. And I remember being forcibly struck by that, that the strongest assertion of the love of God you get in the whole of the Bible contains that statement that it's possible to perish. Now, we all wrestle with this because we don't like it. We just do not like it, if we're honest. But <clears throat> again, I found C.S. Lewis very helpful. Because when you get rid of all the medieval um, pictures of hell, and you'll notice that Jesus preached this mostly to bigoted religious people who thought they had the truth. That is very, very remarkable to see that. If people say to God, I don't want you. When Jesus came, he did wonderful miracles. He healed people. He brought them back to sanity. But sometimes they looked at what they did and said, leave. He left. He will never invade your personality because that would be to turn you into a robot again. And <coughs> the central appeal of Christianity is, I've just said it to you, God loved the world. He, he's looking for a response. He's not looking for people being forced to do something. So if they say no, he will honor their choice. Now what does that mean? And C.S. Lewis is very helpful here. He says, you think about it. <clears throat> Whether you believe in God or not, for the past year, God's been very good to many of us. He's put food on our table. He's given us our talents that put us in a brilliant university. And all the things that have been flowing to us, we may never have said thank you. But it is the fact, suppose all that was removed. Suppose we say no to God, I don't want you in my life, and God gets out of our life. I believe that's what the Bible means, at least in its initial stages by hell. It's honoring what we've asked for. It's not sending people to hell. That is a very dangerously wrong metaphor. It's that God honors your choice. And if you say no to God, even though it hurts him, the cross shows you what he thinks of you and how much he loves you. But if you say no, he has got no option but to honor your choice. He never force your stampede into your life. So that's how I, be, I begin to, to approach that. It is the flip side, and it's very important. The, uh, <clears throat> I think we're probably at the point where we should open this up to uh, questions from the audience. I'll just say, uh, I'm no Dante expert, when I, but when I've read The Inferno, uh, my response has been very similar to what you just said. It's always seemed to me that these people haven't just arbitrarily been put in whatever plight they are in but rather they're just <clears throat> living out what they've made of themselves uh, in their lives, uh, so that, uh, which is very, I mean, I like the way you put that, that they are not sent there, uh, yeah, they've gone right. there yeah. uh, to whatever circle of hell uh, they are in. Um, and it, I, I said before, I'm not going to express <coughs> opinions, but I do think that uh, uh, what I draw from this discussion is that uh, uh, both the Christian believer and the atheist do have serious problems with, with this problem of evil. It is so obviously a problem for the those problem of us who are alive. Everybody. It would be shocking if 
neither one of them, you know, if either one of them did not have that problem, <coughs> but that it, they have different problems. It does seem as if um, uh, Christianity does have a difficulty explaining, not that it can't be dealt with, but they do, it does have a difficulty explaining the existence of evil and, in a sense, the distribution of evil that sometimes seems so arbitrary, but that the atheist has the problem of, first of all, having a foundation for the existence of good and evil at all, and secondly, for finding uh, any kind of consolation um, uh, from evil. So uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, just make your choice. Uh, uh, which difficulty do you want to struggle with? The uh, question I have, and I have so many, but I guess I'd have to achieve the acclaim of Dr. Lowenstein to ask so many, uh, is um, why, what explanation do you have that the, the countries, uh, the non-communist countries with, with some of the highest uh, rates of atheism uh, and the ones that are run on secular values tend to be the wealthiest and have arguably the least suffering. Well, what, I, what your first statement made me think of is that is the actual flip side of that, that in countries where there's most suffering, they discuss at least, uh, which is a, a, very, a, very, a very interesting fact. Um, the question of what the nature of the suffering is. You see, if you look at the West and someone who's got enough money and who's got a good life and all this kind of thing, they're not suffering in the sense that we would see. But what I discover is this, that once some big medical thing hits them, and I'm chaplain in my college, then they start to ask very big questions. You know, some people wait until some earthquake hits them before they'll ask the question. Some of us have been taught to ask the questions before the earthquake hits. But I don't go about it statistically for the simple reason <clears throat> that what I'm interested in is what is true. And if my philosophy only covers the good life, it's very superficial because you say people in the West aren't suffering. Thousands and thousands of people are suffering. You just look underneath the lid of most people's experience and you'll find they're suffering and they need help. And so uh, it seems to me I want to know what is true and I don't want people to have to wait until the earthquake hits them until they raise these questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. This is, uh, I think, the young lady who uh, conducted us uh, from the parking place. To She's this got place. a list yeah. of questions. She's responsible for our being here. <laughs> um, this is one of our text-in questions. Um, someone says, I have a friend who has experienced terrible suffering. Why do you think that the Christian worldview of comforting a friend, say going to church, is more effective than being free from doctrinal bondage and live freely as I please as an atheist? Can you repeat that? I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> so the it. question part was, uh, why do you think that the Christian worldview of comforting a friend, say going to church, is more effective than being free from doctrinal bondage and living freely as an atheist, as he pleases? Oh, I see. Well, <clears throat> lying behind that is the idea that going to church is bondage and being an atheist is free. I would say that being an atheist is bondage to the narrowest worldview you could ever conceive. That <clears throat> life is last 70 years more or less and then there's nothing. That's tiny. That's the thing that compresses people and removes their freedom. <clears throat> it's a very negative view of church. I'd, want to, I'd, I'd suggest the person change church because <laughs> <coughs> not, <coughs> not, not every church you know, I grew up in a home where my parents were Christian, but they allowed me to think, and Christianity was open, it was expansive, it was intellectual, it was so on and so forth. And if you've got a person who's suffering, you will find, as I have found many times, talk to people 
who have found that their support system within the church when they're really going through it is absolutely fantastic. Um, I, I, the trouble is you're asking about a specific case. I don't know about that case. Uh, and therefore, you can't answer it in terms of a generality. But it seems to have a, a rather warped view of church and a warped view of atheism uh, built into it. Thank you. Should we alternate between texted questions and uh, yeah. the work? OK, <coughs> then, uh, this gentleman. Hi, thank you for speaking. Um, I just wanted to ask you if you would, if you were able to suspend your belief um, in God for a moment, I was wondering whether you thought um, that the benefits that belief in God offer us in terms of hope, would that outweigh um, the, uh, the pursuit of truth? So in other words, um, would it be worth it to still believe in God if he did not exist with, <laughs> with, the, with the hope that uh, It'd be crazy us. to believe in God if he didn't exist. Um, suspend belief. You see, let me come clean. I spent I thought that my, would be difficult. I spent <laughs> my whole life questioning my belief. Mm -hmm. Spent my whole life doing it. Uh, that is exposing my faith in God to its opposite and allowing it to be questioned, you see. And that has been in the pursuit of truth. So my conviction that there is a God is because I believe Christianity to be true, and I believe there's evidence that it's true. So <clears throat> I don't even recognize the kind of um, pattern that you're suggesting. I, when people ask me questions, as they do every day, in one sense, you don't suspend belief. You criticize belief. You're critical about what you think, and you subject it to questioning. And that's the way I have found it to grow. Daniel, you feel free to comment on well, that. Well, yeah. I, the, the, <coughs> when we were together uh, here three years ago, our topic really was, uh, is Christianity true? And I think that one thing that John and I agree on, I would assume most people agree on, is that that's the first question, or that's the, that's the final question, the, the, the question that we really <coughs> need to know the answer to in order to answer any of the other questions. Uh, probably the question of whether Christianity can resolve this question of evil bears on the question of whether uh, Christianity is true. Uh, and it's also a question that is so important in our lives that uh, I think it's something that everybody wants to think about and hear different perspectives on. But I, no, I don't, think, uh, I don't think at least f from the two of us you're going to get anybody saying, well, yeah, you should believe in something because it's nice to believe in it, even though it's not true. How can you believe in it unless you unless you believe it? Thank you. Okay. okay. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I know this distinction wasn't brought up in the debate, but I'd like to ask a question about the logical problem versus the uh, probabilistic problem. The logical problem being that God and evil necessarily cannot exist which I know I, I don't think is really defended in academia anymore because it's, it's too strong a burden of proof for the, uh, for the atheist to, to hold. So I'm assuming you're, you're dealing with the probabilistic problem of evil here. In this, in this um, case then, isn't it vitally important to, to think about the conditional probability, the background knowledge of whether or not God exists? So the, the other arguments, the cosmological argument, teleological, et cetera. So even if we do say that, that I mean, it's, it, I know I'm not saying I'd concede this, but as a theist saying maybe it is improbable that God and, that and evil do coexist, given the conditional probability, the, the Bayesian, in a Bayesian sense, it's still not, not a low, I mean, it's, it doesn't do a whole lot to take away from the argument. Well, my reaction to that is to say that the Reverend Bayes was a very brilliant mathematician, and he came up with Bayes' theorem. And I find it is of considerable value in dealing with that kind of background consideration. In other words, let me go wear my scientific hat for a moment. The probability that there is a God granted that there's a fine-tuned universe is very much higher than the probability that there is a God per se. And I, I think you're right there. On the other hand, probability um, <coughs> can be slightly misleading. Um, it's very improbable that Daniel Lowenstein exists. 
<laughs> it's very improbable it's that I exist. And the question is not what is the probability that we exist, but is there evidence that we actually exist? And so I find it very important when people get into this idea of uh, the probability of God existing to say half a moment, guys. We're not basing this as a matter of probability any more than if you were sitting here 10,000 years ago and said, well, now, what's the probability that Daniel Lowenstein will exist? Well, it's pretty, ze well, zero. So what? There's plenty of evidence now that he does exist. So although... <laughs> Thus the problem of evil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. There you are. So I think you... You have a valid point, but it's, it's only a point amongst other things. I see. Okay. Thank you. I, I just w would like to say, I, you started out with saying <clears throat> there could be a logical tension between the existence of God and evil, but if you start out with the idea that God, for reasons that John explained, I think, quite eloquently, uh, created humans who are capable of love, and another way to put that is humans who are free, then it would seem to me to follow almost logically that evil must exist and that the, the implications of God uh, creating a world with free living creatures on it uh, necessarily uh, implies the existence of, of evil. Still, I think that leaves the question, that doesn't answer the question, though, of I mean, maybe it does logically, and I liked the distinction that John drew between the sort of observer from above and the person who is in the situation. Does that answer the question, one of the millions who was sent to Auschwitz and has the experience of being on the train and going through the lines and, and everything that they underwent, does that answer the question for that person? Uh, or does it answer the question for the person who is told he, he, you know, he's 20 years old and he has uh, six months to live, or who uh, is in the middle of Indonesia when there, or on the coast of Indonesia when there's a tsunami. I mean, the, those are hard to answer, but the existence of evil would seem to me to be not logically inconsistent, but almost logically required. Yeah, thanks for that. I missed that bit of his well, question out. Okay, thank I, you. Yeah, okay. <coughs> Okay, um, this text in question says, you say Christianity provides hope. How do we know it's not false hope? Sorry? How do we know that Christian, the hope that Christianity provides isn't false hope? Well, the definition of hope, as I understand it, is my expectation of the future. And it's only going to be as strong as the evidence on which it's based. So that, <clears throat> for me now, there come into play the whole set of evidences, particular and specific evidences that Christianity is true. They split into two parts. There is what I call the objective side of it, the historical side of it, the fact that Christ lived, did certain things, died, and then, all importantly, the fact that I believe that we can access evidence for the resurrection. Now, uh, very frequently people come in here and say, what is the evidence? What is the evidence? What is the evidence? And I got so concerned about this recently, I thought it would be very interesting to take the criteria for witnesses of a skeptic, David Hume, the famous Scottish Enlightenment um, philosopher, and apply them to the resurrection of Jesus. And in the last two chapters of my book, Gunning for God, you can see an analysis looking at that evidence. And I sit here partly because of some of my lawyer friends, actually, which is why I'm so happy this man is a lawyer. I remember sitting in Cambridge in King's College in 1963 with a huge crowd of people listening to one of the most distinguished lawyers in Great Britain. And he says, I am a lawyer. What I'm going to do is to conduct a forensic investigation of the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. It was fantastic. I'd never heard anything like it before. 
So he said, let's deny the resurrection. Now let's look at history. His name is Sir Robert, uh, Sir Norman Anderson, and his little book is still available. And that kind of thing led to me suddenly realizing, gosh, this is intellectually solid. You can commit yourself to it. So there's that side of it. I believe that Christianity is objectively true. But then, uh, why is my hope not a false hope? It's the test proving that it works. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for instance, Christ claims that if a person trusts him for forgiveness of sins, they get peace with God and a new life. I've seen that happen thousands of times. In my own life, in my marriage, I've seen marriages rescued. I've seen people come out of drug abuse. I've seen people on the verge of suicide and they come to trust Christ and their lives are totally changed. When you see that happen again and again, you begin to think there's something in this because Christ makes claims that if we trust him, these things will happen. When they do happen, that is evidence. And I sometimes, I think I said this on Monday night, you know, when you look at the false hope, which I believe atheism is, I'm very happy to come back here in a year's time and you bring 50 people whose lives have been utterly transformed for the good by atheism. And I bring 50 or 500 or 5,000 whose lives have been transformed by Christianity. In the end, it must be based on evidence. And that's why it's not a false hope. And that's why I spent my entire life asking the kind of questions that would show me that it was a false hope or a delusion, if it were. I would say that uh, if, if this questioner or anybody else wants to inquire into this more deeply, uh, I would recommend the two of John's books that I've read, uh, God's Undertaker, which deals with uh, the question of science and religion, and uh, Gunning for God, which deals more generally with uh, arguments uh, in favor of Christianity. Uh, they're very uh, persuasive and uh, eloquent uh, statements for Christianity, and to get you know, a more concise version, uh, look on the internet for the previous interview that we had three years ago. Uh, for the atheist point of view, I'm in, I mean, obviously you can go read Dawkins and Dennett and uh, Hitchens and some of the, the contemporary so-called new atheists. I'm inclined to think that you'll do better with some of the classical uh, writers, uh, such as David Hume, who, uh, whom John mentioned, uh, Nietzsche, whom John also mentioned, uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, Camus. Uh, to my taste or, or judgment, uh, they really were more persuasive in the kinds of arguments they made. But I, you know, I would recommend, especially to young people, whatever your views are, um, you know, do explore uh, all sides of, of the question. These questions are so important. And often, even the people that you disagree with uh, and even if they don't persuade you, can, can give you insights uh, onto things. I mean, Nietzsche, for example, whom I find a very repugnant author in, in many ways, on the other hand, he is a brilliant, brilliant writer, a wonderful poet. Uh, the images in his writing are, are marvelous. And he was brilliant. He writes about a lot of things. So some of the things I find repugnant, but other things are very, very insightful. You learn a lot from Nietzsche. So, you know, especially the young people, but all people explore and, and reach out and, and uh, you know, extend your curiosity. And even if you don't go that far, and I would recommend that you do that, one of the things I love to do is sit down beside somebody I don't know and ask them to explain their worldview to me. You know, and there are people of different worldviews in this room. And if you're not a Christian, grab a Christian and ask them to explain their worldview. And you explain theirs to them. This is a university. This is what it's all about. And it's exciting to have this kind of an opportunity to really inquire. And you get to know people in a completely new way if you respectively, respectfully ask them about their worldview. Thank you. Good evening, professors. Um, I'm the president of the Catholic Forum, and um, every week we discuss different philosophical issues, including philosophical <coughs> theology. So in their discussion, we become very familiar with, especially in the, in the Western tradition, of the different responses to the problem of evil, right? Like evil is a, non, is, is a privatio boni privation of, um, privation of being, and like evil is a, is a consequence of free will, and free will is prerequisite of love. 
or evil produces is has soul making consequences and all these intellectual responses which are very brilliant are intellectual responses it seems it makes sense when the one who's suffering is us um you know like evil is like a note in Mozart's symphony it uh, it amplifies the beauty when taken you know in the big picture <clears throat> but it seems like it sounds we're pontificating when when we tend to be explaining this to someone suffering, especially dear to us, um, it seems like evil has this but, uh, suffering, experience of suffering seems like having this kind of, of experience whereby if we are the ones suffering, we can reconcile ourselves to suffering and um, given all these brilliant um, 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 defenses, I mean, given, given the long tradition of especially 2,000 year tradition of Catholicism, it seems to make sense, but it's, it seems like we seem to be like pontific, or like it seems improper. Yeah, so what, sorry, what's your question? So in the, in the, on the, it's a personal, it's a personal experience of evil. Like what would you tell us if we find our loved ones suffering? It seems like it's, it's not proper to be like referring to these defenses that we're ah, discussing. But you've misunderstood something very important. Mm -hmm. I said it right at the beginning. There are two perspectives. Yeah, the pastoral. And the pastoral uh, side is the very important one. Now, the classic and wonderful example of this is in the New Testament, where there was a little family which consisted of two women and one man, mm -hmm. and he died. His name was Lazarus. And Jesus was not there, and the two women were distraught, and they sent a message to Jesus, who came after the man had died. Now, these two sisters were very different psychologically. Martha was quite tough, intellectual, and when Jesus arrived, she said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died, and they entered into a deep theological discussion about the resurrection at the final day. Mary, though, she was weeping. And what did Jesus do? He didn't enter into a discussion about the judgment, uh, about the resurrection. He wept. And I think sensitivity tells us there's no question of pontificating to people. We're in an open forum here where people have got different perspectives and the need to be exposed to the whole perspective. But in your particular case, when we're dealing with someone who's suffering, you may just go and sit there and hold their hand and say nothing at all, or just listen or weep. And those are the things that are necessary to do. So it's not a question of pontificating, but sooner or later, people will often start to ask questions and you've got to be ready not to dodge the questions, but to give answers as well as your moral and psychological support. Okay? Thank you, sir. Next one, please. <clears throat> Good evening, professors. Thank you for talking to us. Uh, we've been talking about pain, uh, suffering, as well as love. Uh, I watched uh, the movie, The Theory of Everything, yesterday, and it was based on Stephen Hawking's life. It was so amazing to see that how this man who was just given two years to live, lived this long, mm -hmm. and his wife was Christian. And the only thing that occurred to my mind was, regardless of this shell that he, his soul is still right there in, <clears throat> uh, he still was alive all these years by receiving love from his near and dear ones. And I think throughout this suffering, had that love not been given to him, he probably wouldn't have survived this long. But at the same time, he changed his own theories many times, trying to say that he was right at some point, wrong at some point. The movie ends beautifully at the note where he actually kind of acknowledges God. I'm not giving spoilers. Uh, so, but the writer was, he did a brilliant job. And um, my question is this, that have we as Christians forgotten to really love and have the, leader, the Christians' leaders have forcefully been shooing the self-righteousness thing into the minds of people that actually drove away a lot of them from the church. And that's how I've seen churches with a board sign saying, 
a church for sale. I've seen mm, people okay. who were once Christian uh, not going to church anymore. So, have you, is I've that? Got, I understand the question very well, yes. Um, I haven't seen the movie yet. And I'm interested in the little hint you give at the end because Stephen Hawking sadly has written a book called The Grand Design in which he states clearly that he's an atheist. I've written a response to it, by the way, God and Stephen Hawking, but I'm not allowed to commercially advertise, so I'll not tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Hawking, <clears throat> I remember him at Cambridge very well. He was just ahead of me, and he's a, a very, very bright man. And you're quite right. I, I think that his first wife is a believer and poured a lot of love into him. And that obviously is a vastly important thing. Now, you apply it in the context of people leaving churches and so on. In Britain, where I come from, the number one reason given for people leaving churches is they don't answer our questions. And reflecting on that, I, I believe it is a mark of love to answer people's questions. You know, if you read <clears throat> the first encounter of the Christian apostle Paul with philosophers at Athens, he loved them enough to have read their stuff. And I, I think that's immensely important to sit alongside, to love people enough to listen to their questions uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, I mean, the message is clear. It's, it, it is very clear. If, if you don't love people enough to listen to them, you're better not to try to sell your message to them. There is a big lesson to be learned there. <clears throat> Thank you. Right, next, please. Hi. Um, my question is actually in reference to um, the Israeli couple that you said you met. Um, I've been learning Hebrew for the last four years, and I attended a, a Torah, I've attended a Torah study. And I was attending an Orthodox Torah study and I remember the rabbi saying, um, we were talking about, you know, kids growing up and what if they stop believing. The rabbi was like, oh, it's okay, they'll come back eventually. Um, I found that pretty interesting because in Christianity, I'm a Christian, um, especially American evangelical Christianity, it's kind of with the question that the other guy had just asked, uh, you're not allowed to really ask questions. You're supposed to accept and you, you go forward. <clears throat> And then I, I also wonder if you take that and then compare it with uh, uh, Kierkegaard said, you know, Christianizing the pagan Christians in Christendom. You know, I think, is that what we're dealing with today? Because um, I found uh, with people from, say, the Middle East or Africa, uh, even though they might say that they're atheists, they are still closer to a belief in God than we are here in the West. Mm. And maybe that's an assumption on my part, but that's kind of what I've but noticed. Did I hear you correctly suggesting that Christian, you said Christians in America don't allow you to ask questions? Well, a lot of, and maybe it's the political system. A lot of times it's, it's, it's kind of frowned upon. You know, you have to stick with the, 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 you know, the political line. That is scandalous, of course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what's happened over the last, if well, you look at 100 years in America. I, I, I'm, as you can hear from my accent, I'm not an American. <laughs> and I love your country enough not to comment on it. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, uh, but I can comment on my own country. And certainly political correctness is paralyzing a lot of thought. And as a university professor, it really concerns me, the dumbing down. The, I mean, from my perspective, a university is supposed to teach people to think. And it's supposed to expose them to all kinds of views. That's why I so applaud the kind of course that Professor Lowenstein is attempting to set up in this place. And I noticed in various universities, to get people to think beyond the narrow confines of their own discipline. See, I'm a pure mathematician, but right from a childhood, I wondered where does maths fit inside science and how does science help us? What is science, really? And I find people are not being trained to ask questions. Now, I grew up in a Christian home, and I was forced to ask questions. My 
parents pummeled me with questions. So <clears throat> I grew up thinking that Christianity is the open-ended question, and then I discovered other people, they were in churches where they were scared stiff to ask questions. Well, that is no good at all. You must be free to ask your questions and keep asking them. We mustn't allow ourselves to be paralyzed by that kind of nonsense. Otherwise, uh, you end up being totally conformist and learn nothing. So thank you for that point. Okay, right, okay. next. I don't know how much time we've got left, but we're probably running towards yeah, the end. Yeah, last few questions. Um, this person says, how do you reconcile the concept of justice after death in the form of heaven and hell with the Christian concept of forgiveness? How can it be, or how can there be justice if both the innocent child and the deathbed murderer convert both um, and then achieve heaven? The <clears throat> notion that everybody is the same in the world to come is false on both sides of the divide. Christ made that very clear. And justice will be done, and it will be done utterly fairly. Now, you ask, how do you reconcile it with the idea of forgiveness? Well, the first thing now is to tease out what do we mean by forgiveness. Forgiveness has two levels. The Greek word aphesis means to let go. And there's enormous confusion about it. I come from Northern Ireland, and I remember there was a woman who... Uh, whose daughter was murdered, and somebody shoves a microphone in front of her face and says, you forgive the terrorists, don't you? You're a Christian. That's an absurdity. You see, what people fail to realize is that even God doesn't forgive people who don't repent. Because if <clears throat> you forgive someone who doesn't repent, you, you're saying it doesn't matter. Now, this is a very important mechanism. And why people get confused about it is there are two levels of it. If you injure me, I may find it very difficult to let it go and stop it destroying me. But I can't let it publicly go unless you repent. It's meaningless. I'm telling you it doesn't matter. And the world is very confused about this. If you want to read about forgiveness, one of the most moving books in existence, read The Sunflower by Eli Wiesenthal. It is just fascinating. I'll not spoil the story for you, but the, the current edition of it tells a story and then has 50 of the world's top writers respond to the story. It's a very interesting thing. But you see, God himself does not forgive without repenting. Now, some people say half a minute. When Christ was being crucified, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To apply that to terrorists who know exactly what they're doing is morally grotesque and absurd. So I think we need to be very clear that God is magnificently prepared to forgive us, but we've got to repent beforehand. Now, that's a huge topic. It's a topic for an evening, actually. I know I'm not doing it justice, but I'll have to stop there. Okay, um, and then we actually have our last question of the night, so I'm sorry. Um, but um, how... <laughs> sorry, guys. How um, is... A couple people emailed us um, with this question. How is Jesus Christ relevant to the person who doesn't believe they've gone through much suffering and doesn't believe that they've sinned? Well, it's the truth question again. I have yet to meet a person that doesn't believe they've sinned. Have you met one? No. <laughs> All of us know that we failed our own standards and so on. So the question of relevance, it's like, it's like this. Sometimes I use this analogy. Suppose you are lying on the beach and the sun is beaming down and you feel absolutely tremendous. It's California and it's 
It's, uh, it's Laguna Beach and it's magnificent. But I'm up on the cliff and I see you're completely surrounded by an incoming tide. You feel terrific. You've no sense of any danger, any difficulty. But the truth of your situation is that knowledge of the tides ought to be very relevant to you at that moment. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that kind of question fails to see that what we're into is truth. And you're students, you're into truth. What are you seeking for here? You're seeking truth and meaning in life. And <clears throat> it's not a question of whether Christ is relevant or helpful. It's if Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then the biggest thing conceivable in life is to get to know him and to live for him. Just imagine, you think about it, if there is a God, if there is a creator that designed the universe and gave you your life, to go through life and not enter into what you could have done, which is a relationship with the creators, to miss everything. So, to me, it's a question of, is this true or not? If it's not true, I'm not interested in it. Whether you say it's relevant or it helps or it's a nice pill, no. But Christ stands in history and he claims to be the truth. That's a very big claim. And because I've come to the conclusion that that is the case, therefore the biggest thing in life for me is to live for him. And part of the joy of life he's given me is the possibility of teaching in a pretty good university. So that's how I'd respond to that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Again, thank you all for being with us. Thank you very much, John Lennox, for uh, a moving and illuminating presentation. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at veritas.org.